Hi everyone, in this video we're going to go through section um, 3.3 titled Kramer's Rule, Volume, and Linear Transformations. Um, first we'll start with Kramer's Rule, which is Theorem 7. Your textbook has a proof of this uh, theorem and why it is true in all cases, um, but I'm going to not do that in this video. Um, it would be good to read through, um, but it's a little bit of more confusing uh, proof. So notation-wise, um, this is Kramer's rule uses some different notation that is important to understand. Okay, uh, but in explaining it, hopefully it'll make sense. For an n by n matrix A and any vector B in R n, the notation here that we're introducing is A subscript I of B. That is the matrix obtained from A by replacing column I with the vector B. Okay, so column I, whichever column is the subscript, that is replaced by the vector B. And we'll see what that looks like um, in our first example. Then Theorem 7, Kramer's Rule, states that I can solve systems of equations for my unknown variable X, X subscript I, right, that is X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, etc. That is um, the determinant of A subscript I of B, divided by the determinant of A. So we can solve systems using determinants. We just have to compute lots of determinants to solve the system. Okay, so the determinant of my matrix A is always in the denominator, and the numerator is the determinant of A subscript I of B, AI of B, and that is replacing the ith column, so you replace the first column to find x1 with the vector B, and then you get the determinant. If there's an x4, you replace the fourth column of A with the vector B, and then that division gives us um, the, the solution to the system. Okay, let's see that theorem in action in a fairly straight, uh, a small system of equations, two by two system. Okay, so we're going to write down First, my matrix A and get its determinant, 3, negative 2, that's just the coefficient matrix, negative 5, and 4. And then the determinant of A is equal to 3 times 4 is 12, minus 5 times, or well, minus negative 5 times negative 2, so that's going to multiply and give me a positive, but it's minus 10. So 12 minus 10 is 2. Determinant of A is 2. All right, now here's where it gets a little bit wonkier, a little bit more confusing. A subscript 1 of B. We are going to replace column 1 of A with B, the, the, the right-hand side of the equation. So this is 6, 8. Columns two, column 2 stays the same. So then we say, all right, the determinant of A1 of B is 6 times 4 is 24 minus negative 16. 24 add 16, let's see, that's 34, 40. A1 of B is 40. Then A2 of B, A subscript 2 of B is equal to, all right, so I'm going to go back to my original column 1, 3, negative 5, and then replace column 2 with B, 6, 8. And then the determinant 2 of B of that matrix. 8 times 3 is 24 minus negative 30. 24 add 30 is, let's call it 54. All right, so there's my determinant work. Now I can solve the system. Okay, x1 is equal to the determinant of a1 of B divided by the determinant of A, and x2 is the determinant of a2 of B divided by the determinant of A. So in the first case, we get 40 over 2 is 2, or is 20, excuse me. And in the second one, we get 54 divided by 2, which is 27, okay? So x1 is 20, and x2, 27, all right? And there's, that's my solution without doing any row operations whatsoever, only by uh, computing determinants. I'm not going to do the second example here because it's fairly straightforward like the first one, um, but the, the idea of using determinants to solve systems um, comes up in like uh, engineering, specifically electrical engineering, where you use Laplace transforms, which is a term you might have um, heard in a differential equation class if you've taken one. You convert uh, a system of linear differential equations into algebraic equations and the coefficient, or the, the yeah, the coefficients involve some parameter. And so this is a scenario where you might use that because working with 
coefficients that have variables. Like that's my coefficient, that's my coefficient, that's my co well that is, and that's my coefficient. Um, working with coefficients that have variables make row op row operations very clunky, okay, and challenging. And so Kramer's rule uh, and just using determinants to solve the system kind of uh, defeats that problem. Kramer's rule also gives us a new way uh, or a, a formula for finding a inverse that doesn't involve row operations, which again, kind of cool. It's kind of useful, cool use out of Kramer's rule. All right, and so the the wording on this page is fairly um, uh, clunky. It's a little bit abstract. Um, I'll kind of just go over it rather than read it all for you. What this first sentence here is basically saying: the jth column. There's a column in a inverse. And it's a vector that satisfies, well, when I multiply matrix A times that column, I get a column out of the identity matrix. That's that, that that's what that E subscript, subscript J is, okay? And then the ith entry of X, so one of the entries on that vector is the IJ entry of A inverse, right? So that some entry on that column is in A inverse, all right? Again, a little bit more abstract, but what it's, what, how we use that is that with Kramer's rule, a, an individual entry of A inverse, an IJ entry somewhere along the inverse, we find it using Kramer's rule, the determinant of A i sub i of ej divided by the determinant of a. So the same as the fairly simple first example, but now we can use that in a more complicated process concept to find inverses without doing row operations. Okay, uh, a cofactor expansion down column i, so down one column of, the, of my matrix, a i of ej shows that the determinant there is negative one to the i plus j times the determinant of a j i. Ultimately, like I said, confusing notation, these are cofactors of my matrix A. And here's the main formula at the bottom. I can find A inverse, taking one over the determinant of A. That comes from that determinant in the denominator. And then these are cofactors, a cofactor matrix that is called the adjugate of A. Okay, so it's a matrix of cofactors that we divide by the determinant of matrix A. And this is the, um, the, the formula that was on the previous slide, but here we have our formula for inverse. A inverse is 1 over the determinant times the adjugate of A, that is that matrix of cofactors. All right, let's see how this works in, in an example. All right, so we're given our matrix A. Ultimately, we want to find its inverse, inverse using the formula on the previous slide. And we're going to start out by finding 9, because it's a 3 by 3 matrix, 9 cofactors. The cofactor C11, we delete row 1, column 1, right? That's We've done that before. So we're going to take negative 1, 1, 4, and negative 2. And I'm going to emphasize that this first cofactor is, in fact, positive, okay? And that when you do your AD minus BC, you should get negative 2. Then C12, let me emphasize this guy is negative. Now I delete row 1 column 2, but column 1 is back in play, so we go 1, 1, 1, and negative 2. That's not where that's supposed to be. 1, 1, 1, and negative 2 there. There we go. That simplifies to give me 3. All right, and then C1, 3. Delete row 1, column 3. This is positive. 1 minus 1, and then 1, 4. That should give you positive 5. I'm just going to do one more rather than um, write them every single one of them out. Next up is C21. Now I would, let's change color here, now I would delete row 2 and column 1 and C21 is negative and then let's write this down. Uh, what's remaining? 1, 3 and 4, negative 2 and C21 is equal to 14. There we go, 14. All right, so you continue on, find all nine cofactors, and then you can write down the adjugate. So the adjugate of A, and when I write this matrix of cofactors down, it's uh, the transpose of everything that we just found. So those three values go down column one, uh, negative two, three, five, and then down column two is 14, 
negative 7 and negative 7. We didn't find those values. I'm just giving them to you. And then 4, 1, negative 3. Okay, so that's the adjugate. Nine different cofactors because it's a 3 by 3 matrix. And then you write them uh, the transpose of that. Now, the next step to get the inverse, which is what we want, is to find the determinant of A. And I could find the determinant of A using the standard process of getting a determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix, but we can do something uh, slightly different and cool here, and I'll go into why after the problem's over, why it works, okay? Um, but I'm going to find, I'm going to multiply, let me just draw a line there, I'm going to multiply the adjugate of A times A, all right? So I'm going to take that negative 2, negative, oh, positive 3, 5, 14, negative 7, negative 7, 4, 1, negative 3, and I'm going to multiply that by, where did my matrix A go again? It's up there. Times 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 4, 3, 1, negative 2. And go ahead and pause the video and just do a little bit of this multiplication out. Uh, something cool ends up happening. Okay, well, I think a lot of this stuff is cool. You may not agree, that's okay. Uh, but when you do the multiplication, you end up with a 14 there, followed by a couple of zeros. You get a zero there, a 14 and a zero, and then zero, zero, 14, which is 14 times the identity, all right? And then my claim, which I will show you why in a minute, is that the determinant of A is equal to 14, okay? That's just... I'll get to that shortly. So the last step is to say, all right, now that I have the determinant, I have the adjugate. A inverse is the adjugate divided by the determinant. So 1 14th times the adjugate ADJ of A, which is negative 2 over 14, or negative 1 7th, 14 over 14, 4 over 14, or 2 7 3 over 14, Negative 7 over 14 is negative a half. 1 over 14, 5 over 14, negative a half again, and then negative 3 over 14. Okay, so that is the the formula how we find an inverse without using row operations and without using your calculator. And what I mentioned on the in the at the end of the previous example with finding um, the determinant of A in a kind of cool way, right? So I'm just going back to this formula for inverses from before, and I want to take that and multiply on the right-hand side by A, okay? If I multiply A inverse times A, I get the identity, and that's equal to the determinant of A times oh, 1 over, 1 over, excuse me, 1 over the determinant of A times the adjugate of A times A. And now, if I multiply by the determinant of A on the left, then I get that the determinant of A times the identity is equal to the adjugate of A times A. So it was quicker and more efficient to multiply the adjugate times A, um, and then that produces the identity with the determinant along its diagonal. The last application in this section is to area and volume. Uh, if A, if I have A, a matrix that is two by two, the area of the parallelogram determined by the columns of A is the absolute value of its determinant. If A is three by three, then it's the volume of a parallelopiped, which is like a parallelogram, but in three dimensions. Uh, and that's determined by the columns of A. And or the, the parallelopiped is determined by the columns of A. And that is the absolute value of its determinant. Okay, so we have the determinant has practical applications to area and volume of parallelograms. And we'll look at this example where I have a very crudely drawn picture um, over there. We're going to calculate the area of this parallelogram determined by those four coordinates. Okay, so this is all slanty. Uh, it would be challenging to use the area formula of base times height. Um, I could, but it'd be a bit more complicated than what we're going to do here. Okay, our steps that we have to take are first to shift one of those four points to the origin. And I'm going to choose negative 2, positive 2, and shift that to the origin. So we're doing a translation here, right? Um, so I'm just moving this guy up to and over to, and then we'll apply the same transformation to each of the other three points. So 0, 3 shifts to 2, 5, right? We're moving up to 
an over two for each of our four uh, vectors or our four uh, points so that we can write this parallelogram using two vectors. Four negative one shifts to six comma one and six four shifts to eight six. So let me plot those two new points or those four new points over two up five over six up one and over seven eight up six we're about there okay so we look like this all right so i can form that parallelogram now using two vectors and i will highlight the, the helpful ones this vector and this vector uh, form that parallelogram so i'm going to say all right my matrix a my matrix A is equal to the vector 2, 5, and the vector, the other one is, nope, the other one's not 8, 6. The other one is 6, 1. And so the area of that parallelogram, according to the previous theorem, is the determinant of A, which is, actually, no, it's the absolute value of the determinant of A, which is 2 times 1 minus 5 times 6, 2 minus 30, its absolute value is positive 28. So in a fairly straightforward way, uh, we get the, the determinant of that parallelogram, which you absolutely could find using base times height, but there's a lot more computation involved in finding that. And then finally, we apply this process um, of, uh, of finding area to linear transformations. Okay, So if I have a transformation from R2 into R2, or also R3 into R3, all right, and it's linear determined by a 2 by 2 matrix. If S is some parallelogram in R2, then the area of the transformed parallelogram, the area of T of S, is equal to the determinant of A times the area of S, and then the similar uh, application in three dimensions. All right, let's do one example using that theorem to close out the section. And we're given uh, S is a parallelogram determined by B1 and B2 vectors, and the matrix A1, negative 0.1, 0, 2. Okay, and then it says compute the image of S under the mapping X to AX. All right, so the mapping, the transformation, takes vector x, maps it onto a times x, so a is the matrix of the transformation, and we want to know what the area of the transformed parallelogram is. And there's one approach that answers the question using the theorem, and the other approach answers the question in a more traditional sense. All right, so let's use the theorem first. We'll write down what s, <coughs> excuse me, what S is equal to, S is, let's see, the matrix 1, 3, 5, 2. That matrix is my parallelogram, or represents my parallelogram, okay? And the area of S, okay, the area of S is equal to the determinant of 1, 3, 5, 2. Uh, actually, the absolute value of that, I should say. The absolute value of that determinant which is equal to the absolute value of negative 13, also known as positive 13. Now, using the theorem again, we say, all right, I also need the determinant of, whoops, of the determinant of my transformation, the determinant of A, and multiply that out, you would get 2, 2 times 1 minus 0. And then theorem 10, the previous theorem, 10, says that the area of the transformed parallelogram, the area of T of s is equal to the absolute value of the determinant of a times the area of s so in this case it is and that's supposed to be a bracket the squiggly got away from me a little bit there uh, that is 13 times 2 or 26 so the area of my parallelogram is 26. Now, answering this question in a more traditional way without using the theorem, I could also say, and I'm actually perform the multiplication, A times B1, B2, multiply those two matrices, you get that result. The determinant of that is also equal to 26. Okay, so two different approaches um, to the same question, one using our new theorem, one a way that we could have answered it yesterday. All right, um, that is the end of the video. That should get you through the homework on 3.3. If questions come up, please let me know. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.